Hello and welcome to the Chapter 5 Workout Problem video. Let's begin with problem number 1, which has us calculate price elasticity of demand. The equation for a demand curve is P equals 48 minus 3Q. What is the elasticity in moving from a quantity of 5 to a quantity of 6? In order to solve this problem, we first have to use this equation and plug in our quantities right here, 5 and 6, into the equation for Q and solve for P, which is price. In order to find the elasticity, we need to know the not only the quantities which we have, but the matching prices for those quantities in this demand curve. So in order to do this, we've got first, we're going to plug in f the quantity of 5 into the equation, and that gives us a price of 33. Next, we plug in the quantity of 6, which gives us a price of 30. So here's our quantities, 5 and 6, and here's our prices that match up with them, 33 and 30. So now what we can do is plug this into the elasticity uh, equation. First, we have to calculate the percentage change in quantity. So that's what this is right here. So percentage is the percentage sign. The triangle is delta, which means the change in, right? So the change in quantity in this case, which is Q. All that's divided by the percentage change in price. To begin with, here is the percentage change in quantity. Typically, when you find the percentage change in something, you take the difference between the two items and divide by the original number. But in this case, or in, in what we're going to do in this course to calculate elasticities, is we're going to use what's called the midpoint formula. Instead of just dividing by 5, which is the original amount that we start with, we're actually going to come up with the midpoint. 5 plus 6 divided by 2, which gives us 5.5. .5. And what that gives us is an average. Is really what we're looking at here. So as we look at a demand curve, okay, so let's say, for example, here's our demand curve coming down here, right? So what we're coming up with is we, we have two points on the curve. Okay, so here's, here's point one and point two, right? So at point one, we're going to have, uh, let's actually, let's do this differently. Let's call this A, point A, and this is point B. This will, so that at point A, the, say the quantity is going to be 5, and the price is going to be 33. So, the, whoops, 33. This is our match pair, right? So this is quantity and price, which equals a point on the demand curve. Okay, so then we go down to B, which is 6, a quantity of 6, and a, and a price of 30. And so really what we're trying to find is, in between these two points, what is the elasticity, right? The elasticity is E here, in this case. If you, if you were to calculate this, just using the percentage change, just using 5, if you were headed this direction, for example, you would use 5 because 5 would be ori your original quantity, okay? And then you did it the other direction, and you used 6 as your original quantity, right? So moving two directions, you would get, and go ahead and do this if you want to, and prove me out here, you would get two different numbers, okay? So in order for to have consistency in our numbers, what we do is we say, okay, we're going to take the average, and we're going to say right here in the, in the middle, we're going to say, what is the average quantity? What is the average price? And that's done with this component here. We take the, the two numbers, 5 and 6, and add them together. And then we divide by 2, and that gives us the average. And so no matter which direction you're headed on the curve, and this is going to be helpful as well when you take quizzes and exams and all that good stuff, is you use the midpoint formula, and you'll get the right answer every time. You won't have to worry about which direction you're headed. So this is, this is one way to do it. And then the percentage change in quantity in this case is negative uh, 0.181. So let's go ahead and do the percent change in price. 
And we do the same thing. So right here is our midpoint component, right? We, so we take our 33 minus 30 divided by the mid. We plug these two numbers right here into the elasticity equation, which is uh, the, the quantity divided by the price. Change, percent change in quantity divided by the percent change in price. And that gives us a negative 1.91. Now, it's important to remember price elasticity is interpreted using the absolute value. That's what these and the lines are for here that I'm putting in green. So these lines right here mean absolute value. So what we're going to do is we're going to take away the negative, right? We're going to get rid of that negative, and we're just going to have... Uh, 1.91. We don't have to worry about negatives or positives with price elasticity of demand. So price elasticity, we don't have to worry about it. When we get into calculating uh, income elasticities or cross price elasticities, that is when we need to look at uh, the negative or positive of our equation. Okay, so now this is another demand curve, and what we're doing here is P equals uh, two minus uh, two divided by Q, right? And it will ask us for the elasticity between uh, two changes in price, and then another change, two changes in price. So now what we have to look at is we have to say, okay, is this going to give us the same elasticities for both or different? Let's go ahead and calculate our quantities by plugging in our prices, and we have to solve for our quantities. So in this case, uh, we're going to plug in the price of five. And that actually is going to give us 0.4. And, and that's that's solved in this way, right? So we have 5 equals 2 uh, divided by Q. In order to uh, solve for Q, right, that's what we're solving for. We divide both sides by 2, okay, which gets rid of the 2 on that side, right? So we've got Q equals, okay, so so here we go. So, so we're, yeah, so we're going to be dividing by 2 on both sides. So that's that's what this is, right? And so it's going to be 5 divided by 2 equals 1 over Q. Q, and then what, what we do is we uh, take the inverse of both sides, right? So this one's Q on this side. The inverse of this on this side is 2 divided by 5. And so then that equals... Uh, 2 divided by 5 is 0.4. Okay, so that's how we solve that. The next one here is we, we plug the same. Uh, we plug 4, the price of 4 into the equation. It gives us 0.5. Okay, now we go ahead and step through, and we do the percentage change in quantity. Using the midpoint again, that gives us uh, 0.222. And then we do the percentage uh, change in price uh, using the midpo midpoint, right? And that gives us... Uh, 0.222, which is, um, it's actually negative 1, but really it's it's 1. gives us the uh, unitary elasticity on this one. Okay, so is it going to be the same or is it going to be the different? Well, let's go ahead and plug it in. So we've got a 9 for the price, 0.22 for the quantity, 8 for the price. So here's the price over here. Here are the quantities, and we go ahead and plug those in. To our equation and we've got uh, negative 0.128 and for the price it's ne uh, positive 0.118 and our elasticity is going to be uh, 0 0.09 which is just slightly elastic okay let's move on to problem three so in this one we have uh, four t four p equals q and then there were given some and, th and this is the supply curve right so in this case, we're going to have uh, a supply curve, and uh, the price is what we are given, and so we have to then solve for Q in this case, or quantity. So this is the very first one, where uh, price is 3, and we're solving for a quantity, and then it's the quantity is 12. Price is 4, uh, quantity is 16. Okay, We're going to take our quantities, and we're going to plug them into the percent change in quantity, side of the equation and that gives us negative one uh, negative point two eight six we're going to take our prices on this side and plug it into the percent change in price and that gives us the uh, percent change in price of point two eight six we can multiply these by a hundred right 
which then would give us the actual percent change, which would be 28.6%, uh, right, on both of these. We can leave them in decimal form and, and then calculate. It doesn't matter. Either way, the calculations still work. And then we do our elasticity. We divide our percentage change in quantity by percentage change in price, and that gives us uh, 1, which is, uh, again, unitary, elastic. Okay, so the question is, is this going to be the same or different when we use the prices 7 and 8? And the answer is this, right? So we solve again for our quantities right here, and we plug those into the percentage change in quantity, which is gives us a percent of 13.3%, uh, right? Right there. Percentage change in price, again, negative 13.3%, uh, which gives us the, the unitary elastic again. And why is that? So we see that demand curves that are unitary elastic are going to be curved just like this red one here on the white graph, right? It's going to be curved. Uh, our supply curves that are unitary elastics are going to, going to come up from the origin, and they are going to be straight up from the origin, okay? So they're going to be uh, – the number one test is, is it a line? And we look here at our equation, and we tell, yeah, yeah it is a line. Okay, we can we can work it into a line. Okay, and the next is, is it uh, does it go through the origin? Okay, and and the, we we can plug zero in, like for example, Q. Does that give us zero uh, P? And yes, that is true. Or zero into the other side, and yep, we get zero uh, going both directions, right? So that definitely goes to the origin. Zero zero is the origin here, and so if if that works, then that's uh, perfect. Now we're going uh, to problem four, and we'll look at this one. So this one right here, we can tell that it does not go through the origin, right? Because if we plug uh, zero in to Q, for example, it's still, P is still going to be negative eight, okay? And so we know that this doesn't go through the origin. So this is not going to be a, a unitary supply uh, line here. So let's, let's go ahead and plug this in. And we have to calculate the quantity, right? Because we've got the, these prices here. So we go ahead and solve for the quantity. At a price of 4, the quantity is 4. At a price of 7, the quantity is 5, right? So here's our quantities. We're going to plug these into the percentage change of quantity. That gives us negative 0.222. And then our prices over here, we're going to plug those in. And that gives us negative 0.545, which is negative 54.5%. Uh, we divide uh, our quantity here by our price, and that's going to give us the elasticity coefficient of 0.41, which in this case is in elastic. So something important to remember is this it really is the same thing or the same way you calculate the different types of elasticity. So if we're going to calculate, for example, the income elasticity or the cross price elasticity, this is really what we're doing. In the case of income elasticity, our price over here actually then becomes our income. It's really the dollar amount that we're dealing with over on this side. Over here on this side, this is over on the left side, is the ink is the dollar bills. So whether it's income, whether it's price, it, it, for the chance of cross price elasticity, it's going to be the price of of product A, whatever that is, right? Okay, so over on quantity side, it's going to remain the quantity. Really, the difference is uh, on the income elasticity, our quantity is just whatever the quantity of the, of the product is that we're looking at. And in the case of cross price elasticity, we're going to be doing the quantity of, of our product uh, B, right? Because uh, with cross price elasticity, we have price of one, price of A, and quantity of B, right? Because that's where we're going to, that's the one we're matching up our substitutes and our uh, complements with. Complementary products or supplementary products. Okay, so now we're going on to problem five. So in this case, we're, we're going to do a little um, critical thinking, right? To try to remember about perfect inelasticity and how that affects price. So we're, we're looking at Leonardo da Vinci's um, Mona Lisa, the painting, and the Last Supper. If we take a painting of his, like the Mona Lisa here, 
and we say, okay, what is the the supply look like? Is is Da Vinci going to paint any more of the Mona Lisa? No, you know, there's there's no way. There's only one of a kind. So what we have here is a supply curve that is perfectly inelastic, right? There's only a set amount, okay? set quantity. Can't have any more. Really can't have any less. Hopefully, unless you know something bad happens to the painting, right? And, and so, anyways, this is the supply curve, perfectly inelastic. Now, really, what sets the price? Then it all is determinant upon demand, right? So this is demand here, right? So this is demand here in green, and the demand then is really what sets the price, right? Right here, okay? That That is really what determines the price. When we have perfectly inelastic supply is the demand sets the price for the product because, and that makes sense because like if the Mona Lisa was sold, um, really the demand would, uh, like they would probably do it at auction. Uh, it depends on how many people are bidding for it and how much they are willing to uh, what the opportunity cost is for them, right? How much they really want it, what what they're really willing to pay for it. And that defines the demand here, and that would define the price. So here, here's another uh, issue with inelasticity, right? Is we have a certain stadium. So in this case, uh, I put up Lambeau Field here, which is the Green Bay Packer Field. Let's say that Lambeau Field has 70,000 seats. So what is the shape of the supply curve for tickets to football games at that stadium? So one way one way to think about this is uh, inelastic supply curves, right? Ones that look kind of like uh, kind of like the Mona Lisa, right? Is we're saying that we can really not adjust up or down the number of seats or the quantity, right? The quantity down here. So is so can we adjust these 70,000 seats? Can we go, really, can we go up or down? Uh, you know, we may be able to go up or, up or down if we were to expand or do a demolition on the stadium. But for the most part, it's fixed, right? It's a fixed, fixed supply. Therefore, the supply becomes more inelastic. So really, again, the demand curve here, whatever that is, is going to determine the price. And in the end, you know, how many of the 70,000 uh, seats are actually sold on game day, right? It may de depend on who the Packers are playing or how they're doing, right? Okay, so now for problem seven. It says when someone's kidneys fail, the person needs to have medical treatment with a dialysis machine unless or until they receive a kidney transplant or they will die. Uh, sketch a supply and demand diagram, paying attention to the appropriate elasticities to illustrate that the supply of such dialysis machines will primarily determine the price. This is quantity over here and this is price. And let's go ahead and draw, draw the demand curve. So people that need kidneys, are they able to uh, say how many kidneys they need, you know, say when they need them, kind of do, are they able to, is it more fixed or is it more variable, the demand for for kidneys? I would say it's more fixed, right? If you need a kidney, you need a kidney or you're going to die or, or be on dialysis, right? So it's going to be more or less uh, inelastic. So we're going to draw this really steep here, right? This is a steep demand curve. Uh, with the steep demand curve, it really depends on where the supply curve is. So let's say the supply curve's up here and it's coming across. Really the supply curve, for the most part, is the one that sets the price when demand is more inelastic, even if supply is relatively elastic, right? So the, if the demand is inelastic, then really the supply is what sets uh, the price in the market. And for the most part, this, this is not an issue because of regulation and control in the market for kidneys, right? Unless you're in maybe a country where uh, there isn't a program or regulation set up where you, uh, where you can, cannot sell your organs or people can't sell vital organs, right? Um, in the United States, you can't really sell kidneys. You can't just say, hey, you know what? I have a kidney for sale. Who wants it? You donate kidneys. 
Okay, and so that's really something in the United States where we realize demand is inelastic, and so um, we've we've determined kind of a normative economic issue where we've said, you know what, uh, we should not have a market for these types of things. So we're just going to get rid of that option altogether. Is that good or bad? Well, uh, it it depends, I guess, if you if you want to do the want to uh, wait on the waiting lists for a kidney. Um, okay, so problem eight, and this is the very last one. So this one says, assume that the supply of low-skilled workers is fairly elastic. So, so let's go ahead and draw our supply curve. So this is our fairly elastic supply curve in labor, right? So what we've got here is we've got our wage, which is our price for labor, and we've got our number of laborers, right? We've got the quantity of labor over here. And then it says that the employers, which are the demanders here in the in the labor market, demand for such uh, workers is fairly inelastic. So let's draw up a, a more inelastic uh, demand curve, something like maybe like this. So and that's that's a good demand curve. It's it's quite inelastic there. And so, th so the question goes is, is it better to focus on policy tools to shift the supply of unskilled laborers or on tools to shift the demand for unskilled laborers? So where should we focus? Should we focus on demand or supply? And uh, what if the policy goal is to raise wages for this group? Okay, that's the second question. And explain your answers with supply and demand diagrams. Okay, so here's our diagram that we've, that we've written up here. And so let's, where we say, okay, let's look at demand. Let's look at, at g let's give tax breaks to employers, for example, to hire low-skilled workers. Let's maybe give them some extra tax breaks to, to train them or to just hire them all together, right? So what, what, that, what that's going to do to demand is it's going to increase demand. So they're able to say, hey, we're, we're able to demand more. And so we're, we have increased demand here. That really gives us a relatively uh, modest, not very much increase in price or in the wages, right? So price is going up a little and quantity is uh, also increasing. So more people are gonna be hired, right? So here we are, here's our change in quantity. Here's our change in uh, price. Both are going up, so that's good. But really, it's really just helping with employment, not necessarily the livable wage, right? Where somebody has a, a wage that increase and they're able to pay more bills. It's just hiring more people. Oh, what if we uh, increase the supply or decrease the supply? Let's do that. Let's say, for example, we're going to increase supply. So here's S1. This is SO. So let's do an increase in supply. What is that going to do for us? If we increase the supply of, of unskilled, low-skilled workers, let's say, for example, we cut back and we say, hey, you know what? We need more people to do low-skilled jobs. So I don't know. What do you, how do you get more low-skilled workers? Let's say we're going to increase the visas for low-skilled uh, workers coming in. We're going to open up the doors to some countries that want to send their people here or the people that want to come. They don't have any skills. Let's do that. So that's going to be our supply shift here from SO to S1. That is going to drop for low skilled workers. That's going to drop the wage, right? It's really going to put pressure downward on wages. It's going to increase the quantity of workers only slightly. And so is that a good thing to do? I would I would probably say increasing supply would be not good, right? Uh, increasing our demand by giving a tax break might be a good thing to do. Now let's decrease supply. Let's say, hey, you know what? We we want to, uh, I don't know, how do you decrease the supply of low, low uh, skilled workers? We're just going to get everybody to college. We're going to get the skills set up. We're just going to get everybody. We're going to shut off the borders. We're going to say, we're going to go with Trump's deal and say, build a wall. No low skill workers are coming in. What does that do for us? Well, that's going to shift us up here, right here, right? So this is going to be our new equilibrium. And 
What's that going to do? That is going to raise our price or our wages quite a bit. Uh, it's only going to decrease unemployment or the employment for those in the field only a little. So our, our decrease in quantity from from our decrease in supply this way, right? So this option gives us higher wages and it decreases just a small, small decrease in in uh, employment. So for those that are still able to get jobs, they're going to be doing a lot better. Uh, so what do you do? Well, I, I would say maybe the safer way to go is to mix mess with the demand curves and increase demand by... Uh, giving employers tax breaks by whatever the case is, right? Just increase that demand on the employer side, uh, which is, it's it, in a lot of ways, it's uh, controversial, right? So this is really the basis for uh, a lot of the tax plans that say, hey, let's let's give companies and people that employ people, like small businesses and those things, Let's help them out. Let's give them tax breaks. Let's give them the ability to demand more labor for their business. And this is really kind of one of the, the arguments for that type of tax breaking. And maybe it's even companies that are making lots of money already. Uh, let's give them a tax break. Well, should we do that? I don't know. This seems to say, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Give let them demand more low skilled workers, and that's going to help overall. That's going to help the unemployment or level go down. It's going to increase employment, and it will slightly. It'll start ticking up on our uh, wages as well. So, anyways, uh, that's our workout problems for chapter five. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or give me a call. Thanks. Bye.